Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks for joining us. Well, you could have gone to listen to Henry Dimbleby, but I can assure you this is going to be much more enlightening. So we've got, uh, we've got three speakers for you this afternoon. So we've got Jimmy Goodley uh, from Norfolk, Chris Hollingsworth from Suffolk, and, uh, and Ed Norton from the Cotswolds. So what we're going to, the format we're going to take uh, for this session is um, we'll start off. Jimmy's going to give us a run-through of his farming system, uh, some of the reasons that's drawn him into, into Regen, and a few slides. Uh, and then Chris and Ed will do the same. And we've got a couple of questions that we'd like to sort of throw out there. But the way this will work best is if you can challenge our speakers and ask questions. So let them do their presentations first, and then we'd really like as many questions as possible from you. So, Jimmy, if I can pass over... To, oh, I should have introduced myself. My name's Ian Piggott. Um, I farm about 25 minutes from here, and uh, I've been dabbling or practising regen for about eight years myself. So, no expert, but learning. Jimmy. Thank you, Ian. Oh, hello. Thank you. Um, I've already realised that actually I've got three things in my hand and only two hands, but if we tolerate, I'll probably refer to my notes a little less than I should have done. So, regen farming... Um, I thought I'd start with a question which I get asked a lot is, what is it that you do? And what is regen farming? I know what organic farming is. That seems fairly easy to identify. And I know what conventional farming is. What is it that you do? For me, regen farming has become all about a thought process. Um, to work for me is utterly maddening. I ask a thousand different questions about everything I do. So whether it's nutrient applications, cultivation applications, every question gets asked, trying to move away from inherited thinking. So motivation, methods, chemistry, biology, and the economics of the thing that I do. So motivation. Six years ago, I feel a relative new boy to the regen game. Um, six years ago, pre-Brexit, post-Brexit, I just thought the outlook for farming going forward looked tricky at best. I felt that perhaps political support for the industry was going to be on the wane, and I was very keen to try and future-proof my business. I also felt trying to grow food in a new era of extreme weather, seems to have become our weather now, um, how can I future-proof my business going forwards? So, methodologies. So, effectively, from our standpoint, it is how do we improve our soils to require less dependency on bags and bottles? The one thing I know for sure is that the ag chem companies are not going to suddenly start producing their chemistry for less cash. So the only way I can try and get out ahead of that is to reduce my cost of inputs. In order to do that, it starts with getting the basics right, taking weight off the soil perhaps looking at tires, types, tire pressures. Um, and then, as the soil starts to improve, it then requires less tillage. Now, the most important thing is to context of this matters. This works for my soil type. I live in North Norfolk, so I'm also in an incredibly low rainfall area. I farm on a glacial valley. I have everything from hedge to hedge to blow away sand to slabs of clay. And we have transitioned from a min-till system. So our journey forward has been you know, a relatively fast one. So I'm also a numbers man. So I want to know what were my soils and actually what are my soils going forward. So I'm sure lots of you are familiar, land crop uh, sample results. So these are two different fields before you think, my God, in five years, looks what he's done. The one on the left is um, a sample that was taken two years ago for one of the fields that was uh, the last to be brought into the regen system. I have graduated our transition in. The one on the right is a, um, is a result taken uh, this year. So, you know... It's just identifying, right, where are my soil organic matters? Where are they transitioning to? How quickly are they transitioning there? Does the soil organic matter improvement curve look like that? Does it look more gradual? So that's an important thing. And if I don't know what that's doing, then I ultimately don't know 
whether what I'm doing is working or not. So this is the second, second stage of it. So physical analysis of the soil, knowing that I'm comparing like for like is an ultimately an important thing. Uh, Solvida test, the breathability of the soil. At its most sort of simple, how much are my microorganisms in my soil breathing um, is how that's calculated. And then you end up with a soil assessment score. Our soil assessment scores are transitioning to what we're seeing on the ground. Our crap soil scores are resulting in crap crops. It is as simple as that. So now that I feel like I've got the geology sorted out on my, on my farm, it then allows me to manipulate the chemistry and the biology. So this is really when the battle against bags and bottles begins. So this is the first trial we did. Nitrogen. I thought when we did this uh, report, nitrogen was expensive two years ago. Just goes to show how much I know. Um, and we wanted to try and make the nitrogen more plant available. So um, we had spent a lot of time listening to a guy called Joel Williams. If you're very bored, he's well worth listening to. Um, and he's got this sort of fascinating concept of foliar N and how you can manipulate foliar N to make it more available. And that is adding sources of carbon. So we did a trial. We did uh, fulvic and humic acid mixed. We did, um, we did fulvic acid alone. And we did milk. Now, I appreciate I'm hoping there's nobody from the EA here because, of course, applying milk to soils is a gray area at best. Um, but I had a, a nice dairy farmer down the road who said, yeah, you know, we can apply 50 liters a hectare um, with your nitrogen, and we'll see what happens. Um, and then we did uh, grain testing, because ultimately what I'm actually interested in is how much N is um, existent in the grain post-harvest. And you can see, both in the terms of protein and nitrogen, by adding that source of carbon, we got a significant uplift in the nitrogen availability. So taking that, our now farm standard is 175 mil of fulvic acid per hectare with um, our nitrogen applications. We're only applying 175 mil because when I tell you how much fulvic acid costs, you'll be wondering why I even apply that much. OK, so, okay, so we've, we've manipulated the nitrogen just with a source of carbon. This is then the bio. So, you know, I'm not going to use the term biostimulant because you'll all turn and mark straight out the tent because you realize it's just brown water. But we have got a biology program here now, and it's a molasses and microbial-based um, uh, soil-applied um, system. And in conjunction with that, there is a calcium-based disease controller. The way that is... Um, hopefully working, and this is our first full season of trials. So what immediately stands out is the bit that looks awful. That is bio alone. Okay, so that is effectively an organic grown crop. I think the more interesting part of that photograph is there's no significant distance between what is biology with 20% less than the farm standard, 20% uh, below farm standard without biology, and uh, the sort of effectively full application. Uh, just another thing that we do, which I think is interesting, is grazing of rape. So we had this issue of, for me, it was a growth regulator. So we now drill our oilseed rape very early. We drill it in July. And off it goes, and it looks absolutely tremendous. And you think, right, if I get six inches of snow, what the hell's going to happen then? So realizing that there's no growth regulator available, we thought, right, we'll put a U in the field and see what will happen. And it sort of stared at us for a while and looked fairly bemused and then put its head down and started eating. So before you know it, 399 of her mates are all standing in the field with her. And developing from a growth regulator, we then realized that actually, hang on a minute, mechanically, we're also knocking off the outer stems with their feet and with their mouths, they're eating the outer stems, which is then preventing the flea beetle migrating from the leaf into the stem. So absolutely stumbled into cabbage stem flea beetle control. Um, and it's worked. This is what it looks like when you get it right. This is what it looks like three years earlier when you're just figuring it out. 
So on the left-hand side, that is me inadvertently feeding my very valuable crop into an animal that at the time was not very valuable. So it is a, you know, and we're still finding our feet on this. I'd love to tell you that we nailed it straight out the, straight out the wrapper, not so much. So just the final thing is the economics of what it is and what drives us forward. So management of risk, by using home safe seed, untreated, applied early, directly drilled into a, a muck and compost blend, my financial risk in that oil seed plant is incredibly limited. That way, if I get clobbered with a flea beetle, you know, I've lost very little. I've learned very quickly that chasing yield. So yield can be bought, but I'm only driven by gross margin. So margin, margin, margin. Building resilience. What is it? 1% of organic matter translates to 20,000 gallons of water per acre. I don't think the climate's getting any easier anytime soon. So if I can build resilience into my soil, all the better. And the last thing, which for me is a big thing, and obviously you guys have already got it, you're here, is to keep learning. You know, this constant um, gaining of knowledge. You know, there's a huge number of very, very clever people out there who will absolutely help you. And for me, it's been invaluable of picking up the phone and not being unashamed of the stuff that I simply don't know. So I'll hand over. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, Jimmy, thank you very much indeed. That's uh, for a whistle-stop tour. There's a, a lot of stuff in there that you've brought up that I think we'd like to come back to. But first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Chris Hollingsworth. Chris farms uh, in Suffolk. And um, it'd be interesting to hear through your talk, Chris, also some of the stuff that made you make the transition from quite an intensive cultivation system to where you are now. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, yeah, we're on this chalky, uh, chalky boulder clay Hanslope series, heavy soil uh, in West Suffolk. Um, a little bit of history about the farm. Uh, my grandfather started farming in the late 20s, and he grew an awful lot of fr top fruit. And so quite a lot of the farm has been in, had been in top fruit from somewhere like the mid-30s right the way through until the 70s when we went out of fruit and more into cereals. And with the advent of yield mapping on combines, when I looked at the yield maps, it became quite clear to me that there was a correlation between organic matter and, um, uh, and yield, improvements in yield. And really that set me on my journey to regenerative farming. In 2017, we started doing it over the whole farm. And in 2021, last year, um, I joined up with a local farmer called uh, the Driver family, and his son Adam, we both farm roughly the same area, is now managing the whole enterprise. I just want to touch to start with on what I think are important, which are some of the cost savings. I won't dwell on this too, too much, but let's just run through them. I mean, obviously, you've got machinery. Your, your depreciation bill goes down. You've got the fuel bill goes down. Your fuel repair bill goes down. Your labor goes down. Your base fertilizer goes down. I mean, what I hadn't, uh, believe, uh, hadn't realized until I went into regenerative farming is that there is a big difference between the soil levels of phosphate and what is available, especially on our alkaline soils, and that phosphate very quickly forms a complex with calcium. So historically, we've been imply, applying phosphate for crop offtake but this is too simple, and we now look, take into account the pH, the uh, capacity, uh, cation capaci uh, exchange capacity of the soil, the soil microbial activity. So there are, there's big savings there. The other savings we had was, if you speak to your accountant, is you can put this down as research and development, which gives you big tax savings. Let's also think about the additional income. You've got winter cover crops under your, your mid-tier stewardship. You've got the sustainable farming incentive, which we're going to get at least £40 a hectare, possibly more. And also we've got carbon sequestration, the selling of ISO carbon certificates. We went with a greener, and in Harvest 21, that was worth between £50 and £60 a hectare to us. And we're signed up for £62. So there is, that, that's all good income for us. One thing that we, the other thing that we've done 
is we have joined and formed with a, uh, a local group of regenerative farmers um, to compare our costs. We're using a guy called Gary Markham from Land Family Business. He's actually here at the show. He's been really useful in letting us, uh, in comparing our costs with other regenerative farmers and also comparing how we're doing and how we're faring against conventional farming systems. So really, really well worthwhile. I will move to another slide for you. Um, there is a weak link in, uh, that we found in our system, and that's in the establishment of spring barley on our heavy soils in a dry spring. And we keep having dry springs, and we keep really struggling with that. And there's absolutely no way that we can get our spring barley to yield as well as the guys who are doing it conventionally. As far as the other crops we're growing, the winter wheat, winter barley, or seed rape, to a certain extent, the spring oats seem to cope better with the dry weather than the spring barley. And the winter beans, we feel we're not doing too badly compared to other farmers in the area growing conventional crops. Um, the other things that I'd like to talk about, one is the things that you need to consider for, for it are controlled traffic, uh, improving your drainage, regular mole draining, uh, we've used a stripper header. Um, we like the stripper header. Uh, we think the stripper header creates a really nice climate to establish the crop, crop in afterwards. I don't know whether I've got a crop. There's a crop of wheat growing into stripped spring oats. Um, like James, we're looking at re the reduction in, in nitrogen by using... Uh, we're, we're still trialling it. We're not as far ahead as him, but we're using fulvic acid, molasses, citric acid, manganese, and N20, and reducing our crops by 40 to 50 kilograms of nitrogen. Um, one point that we think is important is to keep the nitrogen-sulfur ratio right, so we work on a three-to-one basis on that. We, like James, we follow Joel Williams, we follow Ben Taylor-Davis, and a guy called Neil Fuller to help us with the huge complexities of soil, fertilizer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing we're trying this year, which we're fitting on our combine, that's just the, the thing arriving. It's called a Redicop seed controller. We're having one fitted on a class 8800. Uh, eight, um, so that should reduce the amount of volunteers. It will kill the weed seeds. Um, we're very concerned and thinking about the amount of crop damage we're getting with our residuals. I think it might be worse in a no-till situation. There's less soil cover sometimes around the seed. And so for us, that plant health herbicide damage is quite important. So if we can kill the seeds beforehand, that's good. And also spray technology is changing. I think we're, we're less than two years away from being able to use a spot spray system where the algorithm cameras on the sprayer can actually distinguish between green and green, green weeds against your crop. It's going to have a huge influence and hopefully reduce our, our um, chemical bill no end. I'll put that picture up very briefly. Um, I was down in Devon and I saw that. I mean, I don't think we need to talk about soil erosion anymore than that one photograph. And finally, um, I don't know how many of you uh, have ever seen Peppa Pig. I rather hesitated about putting this slide up. I didn't want to be compared to, um, to Boris Johnson in any way. But I think it's encouraging to see that the next generation understand the importance of biodiversity. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, our final uh, speaker we're going to hear from before we open up for questions is from uh, Ed uh, Horton. Ed, you farm in the Cotswolds, quite an interesting mix of uh, livestock and, and crops, so we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, my name's Ed. Uh, we farm um, just outside Sirencester on basically about three centimetres of rubbish topsoil overlaid with bedrock. Um, so... Uh, we started our, well, 
you can call it whatever you want, whatever swanky label. I call us a hybrid system. Um, I'm maybe not the biggest fan of the word regen because I feel it might have been nixed by other things and, and, and used in a different way. I call us a hybrid system because we sit somewhere between conventional and organic. Um, we have taken what we like to think is the best of an organic system and fudged it into a conventional system to effectively try and produce near on the same conventional yields as we used to produce under a, under a normal conventional system without fungicides, without herbicides, without insecticides, without growth reg, and we are managing to grow uh, group three milling wheat with about 85 kilos of N these days. So we're getting there slowly. Um, so our farming system, we, um, we're a mixed system. We lamb 3,500 sheep in-house. We buy another 2,500 store lambs a year. The reason we carry so many sheep is sheep are now my fungicide my growth reg, uh, my flea beetle control, uh, my cover crop destruction, my volunteer removal. Generally like to fill the quiet times when I'd like to sit down and watch TV and uh, someone has to go and chase a sheep round because it's got out from an electric fence. Um, we carve a herd of beef cattle. Um, they manage our either very wet Thames Valley uh, floodplain land or vertical solid rock limestone grassland. Um, and provide an awful lot of FYM for us. We also have an in-house uh, pig finishing unit that provides 65% of our um, nitrogen requirement comes in the form of pig slurry. Uh, when you have 8 million gallons of it a year, um, you can feed an awful lot of crops with that. Um, so with livestock integration into the arable system, we also grow a huge variety of crops. We've moved away from where we used to be 10 years ago, which was a rotation that had I could plan for the next 50 years in one go because it went wheat, winter barley, rape, wheat. That was it. Didn't really grow spring crops. If it was too wet to put winter barley in, we put spring barley in. Um, and that was basically what it had been for a long time because it ticked lots of nice boxes. It fitted in three massive great sheds, and that was nice and easy. Um, I've slightly dragged us away from that. We now grow 18 different combinable crops, uh, and there are seven other crops in the system that some of them don't go through, com well, the other seven don't go through combines. Um, I like to make things difficult for myself. I like a challenge every now and then. Um, those things vary from things like phacelia. So we grow phacelia as a seed crop. Um, we grow... Uh, spelt for one of our one of our end users is sitting in the back of the tent at the moment um, who we grow spelt for uh, we are about to start trialing growing durham wheat for them um, local family mill uh, 25 minutes down the road from us um, bertie and i bertie likes to make me do strange things with some of my crops um, so livestock integration cropping variety soil health but that's been covered incredibly well i'm not going to go anywhere near your science-based approach, because I can't give it any, I can't do it any better than that, and I don't have any swanky slides to show off either. Um, but soil health is key to all of this as well. And the last part that we have found that joins the whole system together for us in removing inputs um, and, and farming in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly more sensitive way is the biodiversity. Um, having a working ecosystem, not just around a crop, having a working ecosystem in a crop and part of that is having a working ecosystem below a crop as well. So we have a massive mid-tier scheme. 30% of our farmed area is not actually producing a, a sellable commodity in the terms of a crop. It's producing a sellable commodity in uh, an environmental stewardship scheme. And then within crops, thanks to removal of herbicides, I live really happily with the fact that just the other day I could stand in a field of, uh, field of milling wheat and I couldn't hear myself think for skylarks and bees because I was also surrounded by, now, PR bit here, arable flowers or weeds, depending on which side of the fence you fall. I like a PR spin. They're arable flowers. Nothing wrong with a sound thistle in a tram line. It's flowering. It's producing pollen. It's producing nectar. It's not going to get in the way of my sample when a combine goes through it. The only thing it does is allow me to get ribbed by my neighbours. Um, about uh, having dirty crops. Um, so having working um, bio, having a working biodiversity and working ecosystem in crops um, is vital for us. They are our insecticide control. You know, we haven't used um, we never we haven't used we didn't use deter for five years before it was then removed as a seed dressing. But James, we don't use seed dressings at all. We don't want to isolate that seed in the soil against fungi. I don't want to then um, 
have to use insecticides. So by having biodiversity in crops, we have natural predators. I'm still yet, touch wood, to have any problem with BYDB in any form of cereal crop over winter because we have an insane amount of ladybirds. You can't really find an aphid without a ladybird being attached to it already. Um, flea beetle-wise, I have parasitic wasps coming out of my ears um, when, it, when it comes to putting all seed rape in. Um, and the way in which you get biodiversity into crops is, is with either companion cropping or with um, bicropping or polycropping. It's all very trendy these days. Um, effectively, it's it's old-fashioned, cheap way of grazing sheep. Shove clover under a crop of wheat. Once the combines come off a field, you've got high-protein grazing for us in the middle of August and September where we struggle for grass growth. So um, having this sort of whole... The whole system works supposedly works together. Sometimes it doesn't. Sheep strangely are a very important part of my life as an arable farmer. Um, I spend more of my life now worrying about what sheep are going to eat and where sheep are going to be in my system uh, rather than actually what my crops are doing, uh, which is strange and, and slightly scary occasionally. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the basic principles that we have is diversity of crops, so biodiversity in crops, livestock <laughs> integration, um, and soil health. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, have we got any burning questions from the audience to start with? Start us off. Uh, okay, thank you. We've got a microphone at the back if anyone's got any questions. There's a, uh, a lady on the right. Thank you very much. Um, just while we're waiting for that, um, Jimmy, have you anything that you've tried so far that you've sort of lessons that you've learned that have been a bit uncomfortable? I mean, I think anybody that's gone down this route, I mean, innumerable number of things that we've got wrong. Um, try to avoid repeating them. Often repeat them at least once, but then on the third time, definitely don't repeat them. Um, it's, it is, it's a real journey. I think what is quite interesting is we talked about seed dressing, you know, so, you know, we we didn't buy. Well, I I spent a lot of time buying seed and being told that I had to buy deter because single purpose dressing was crap, and then deter gets banned, and the same guy is then on the phone saying, "No, you really need single purpose dressing on your seed." So, like, oh, is it radically chemically changed? No, it's the same. So, okay, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. And we learned that, of course, because we're direct drilling, we're not getting mineralization in the soil, so we weren't getting rapid. Uh, plant development. But of course, as soon as you take the seed dressing on, which by definition is a growth inhibitor, suddenly you ended up with the plant, you know, arriving a lot sooner than expected. So I think probably most of the developments on the farm have been stumbled into off the back of, you know, taking one question and then it raises another 50 questions. So no, no insecticide? We, well, interestingly, so this year I would usually very proudly sit here and say I don't use insecticide on my oilseed rape, uh, which we don't. But actually, we, this year we had an invasion of weevil, um, which we were genuinely concerned about. So actually, this year we did put a insecticide on to treat the weevil. To come to Ed's point, yeah, it's very much a hybrid system. So it is how we minimize the use of this stuff but at the same time, I'm not simply going to not use it. I don't really have an aspiration to be an organic farmer, although I now take more from the organic model than I do the conventional. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jimmy. Chris, I'll come to you in a sec, but we can have the question from the back. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wondered how you successfully um, under-sow clover into your wheat, especially if you still, you, you know, if your farmer's still using herbicides. Um, so for us, we don't use uh, any herbicides. Uh, our herbicide control is done um, with inter-row camera-guided hose. Um, and those hose have the ability uh, with seeder units on top to under-sow as we weed. So we'll go through when the sheep have grazed a crop of wheat um, and we've put the slurry on uh, in March, which is basically most of its nitrogen. Middle of April, soil temperatures should be there. Hopefully there's some moisture. The past couple of years have proved me really wrong in that respect um, in the middle of April. Um, we will, if they need weeding, we will put the hoe through them and we will put the clover on um, out the seeding unit with the back of the hoe or we use um, comb harrows just you know, in a very simple, almost organic way is, yep, use the comb harrow, you know, 12 meters wide at 15K, you can cover some ground quite quickly blowing on low rates of, um, low rates of perennial uh, shortleaf white clover. Um, 
Chris, are you, are you undersowing at all? Or, or? Uh, no, we, we're not undersowing them. But uh, with your cover crops, so what? So you've got, you mentioned uh, your spring barley you've gone against, but spring oats, so you grow a cover before the spring oats? Yeah, we grow cover crops and catch crops. So we grow cover crops for everything that's going into the spring um, and catch crops between winter barley and, or between all seed rape and wheat, that sort of thing. Okay, so a, a lot of people who are already committed to cover cropping, that you find that year on year they might add an additional um, uh, additional species into their mixes, so... You know, they might have been three, five years ago, and that up to sort of 10, 12 mixes. What do you, what do you? Yeah, we're, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible, and we try and keep it below. Well, we were trying to keep it below 20 pounds a hectare, but we sort of moved up to about 25. Um, I think the important thing is to have uh, plants with different root systems. So, for instance, something like Phycelia is very good. Lots of fine roots, linseed. Um, it has lots of strong, deep, is a deeper rooted plant, picking up nutrients at different levels. Um, I, to me, mustard always looks great from the surface, but I'm not, I think it's questionable how much good it's doing to the actual soil. Um, but to keep it fairly simple, yeah. Excellent. Any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, we'll carry on at the front here. Yes, we've got a question at the back, please. Sorry, and then we'll come to the front. Sorry about that. How do you encourage chit of weeds before, especially your winter crops? And I'm especially conscious that I'm trying to reduce the amount of kit machines on my farm, not increase them. So just to uh, encourage a chit, do you say, in the weeds? Okay, so Ed, do you want to...? Uh, for us, like everything in my world, sheep... Go and walk, go and pen a thousand ewes on a 30 acre field of, of, of wheat stubble uh, five minutes after it's rained. And I tell you what, it's the quickest flush of volunteers you've ever seen in your life. Um, so, yeah, uh, sheep or put the rolls over it. 18 meters of Cambridge rolls can cover some ground in a day if there's some rain forecast. Happy days. That's interesting. I, we, we wouldn't try and encourage a chit, we would, we would put a catch or a cover in straight away. And let that grow on, drill into it, and then and then take it out with the the preem. But Jimmy, what are you up to? Well, we're we're big proponents of compost. So um, you know, there's quite a lot of the time when we simply run a, a carrier, 25 mil, cross cutter roller, um, and if we've got particularly high weed burden fields, historically brome is our um, is particularly our weed of choice. Um, is, uh, yeah, so, you know, never more than 25 mil. It literally, effectively, all we're trying to get is a chip. We're certainly not trying to cultivate anything or disrupt anything. Are you particularly talking about black grass or anything in particular that's concerning you? Nothing in particular. Yes, there is black grass, but nothing like many others have, I'm glad to say. Um, but just talking to people, we're at the stage of probably going down the direct drill route. Everyone's saying, get that chit, straw harrow. And that I have my reservations on that due to our ground. But it just sounds like another bit of kit. A bit like one of you had this intero camera guided hoe. That sounds like a very expensive bit of kit. Um, I'm trying to reduce the kit. I think if just yeah. make sure that the kit, you, you, you know, is a targeted, as I said at the sort of start, make sure that it's a targeted thing and that it works on your soil type. So we trialed a straw hoe, and it just didn't work at all. So, you know, it's whatever works on your particular soil. Chris? Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think your weeds are going to chit. Um, you've just got, obviously, if you've got a real big burden of black grass, you're not going to drill in the, uh, in the winter. You're going to have to drill in the springtime. But if you are going to drill in the wintertime, uh, what we would do is we would, we would wait for it to rain. Um, we might drill the crop before then. But then we would um, give it the glyphosate before the crop emerged. So it's just timing, really, um, and being patient enough to wait for it for the rain. I think if you if you have the rain, the, the the black grass will germinate. The other solution, of course, is if you sell every bit of kit, you can't create a chit. Just just trust yourself. Can we have the question at the front? Hi, 
is someone who's new to no-till, first year in, what was the one biggest challenge you each had to overcome in your respective holdings in going down this route in the first few years? Uh, so, I mean, is now the time where I say I still own a plough and you all, like, throw rotten tomatoes at me? Um, we're not... I'm, I, we, we don't sit on the never going to cultivate anything again. I still have large parlor cultivation kit because they each have a place sometimes in the in the system uh, we still have a big plow sometimes that is the right thing to do but predominantly what we found is um getting soil structure correct is the is the best way to start was if you if you've got no soil structure you can't go direct drilling because it will only come back and bite you um at the end of the day is what we found so occasionally ripping a leg through it Putting a plow on it if it needs it is 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 still is you know again it's our hybrid way of doing it. It's choosing what's correct for that field in that situation for that crop, not having a sort of hard and fast rule of I will never cultivate ever again. Chris, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, if I was to do it again, uh, the one piece of advice I give you is look upon no-till as like a spectrum. At one end you've got conventional farming, and the other one end you've got complete no-till. And it's a journey along that. So if the field isn't right or in good enough condition, then you're going to need to do some remedial work before you go into it. Be, be prepared to accept that not everything is going to go right. You're going to make a few mistakes, but you're going to learn, really, having farmed for years and years with a can and with a blueprint for growing the crops. You're going to learn to become a farmer again and to make decisions. And some of those decisions will be the right ones, and some won't. You've just got to hope that the right ones are more than the, the others. Jimmy? Crippling self-doubt, I think, is the answer <laughs> to the question. Um, you know, farmers are very good at throwing rocks at each other. Um, you know, we've all driven down roads, looked out and thought, well, that field of wheat doesn't look very good, with absolute no context whatsoever of what are the challenges faced with that farmer, what's his soil type, is he trying something different? So what you need is a couple of really good mates who, when you think you're losing your mind, you can pick up the phone, they come and walk round, and they just hold your hand and assure you it's going to be all right. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. If, if I may add, because um, I'd, I'd made the decision to jump in feet first and sell and just end up with a drill... And I think that a lot of the time we look for remedial solutions and the reason we might need them, and it's not perfect, but they, most of them are self-inflicted reasons. You know, whether we've been on the ground when it's, too, when it's too wet or perhaps we've had a poor previous crop that will then lead us to problems in the fault. You know, if, if you try and cut corners, it will bite you, as Jimmy says. Um, right, so we've got staff. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, with those of us who are very much in the infancy of sort of transitioning across on our soils perhaps aren't as, as, as easy working in the spring as, as, as some of your, your lads, uh, your soils are. C can you give those of us advice? We, I'm, I'm finding it really difficult establishing um, crops in the spring. Um, it, it, we seem to have two-day soils. One day it's too wet and the next day it's too dry. Uh, and if we do get it in, then uh, we get some dry, dry weather, then the slot just opens up and, uh, and, and, and we've got some appalling... Um, spring cropping. Uh, any tips on that, especially from Chris, maybe? Uh, yeah, first first tip, uh, use a tine drill in the spring, not a disc drill. Nothing worse than the disc opening up, out comes the sun, and it goes hard. It's a very harsh environment for the seed to grow in. Um, the other problem is where you've got a lot of straw there. So I think this year we're going to possibly go back to baling up straw where we're going to be growing some of our spring crops. As the years go by, you do build up quite a lot of straw on the surface. Um, those would be my two. And pray that you're going to get a bit of rain directly after drilling. <laughs> so, um, Chris, you go to church on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a good day to drill, because he's only got two. <laughs> um, so you're, you're growing some spring oats. Are you growing... Uh, We're growing spring barley and spring oats. We would grow spring beans occasionally. And you are, you are growing spring barley? We have got spring barley. It yeah. doesn't look very good this year. Okay. Uh, 
head. I mean, I, if you're on heavy soil, I'm afraid I've got no advice. I don't know what soil looks like. I have rocks. It's really easy. I mean, I we plant spring barley in January because we can, and it's quite nice. Sorry. I can't... I should be really honest. There's no point in me giving you advice. I don't really have any on that front, I'm afraid. Jimmy. I mean, just very quickly, obviously, slightly to come to... You know, not knowing the soil and where it is in its in its sort of transition. But I think in terms of it feels like a sort of confession, I also am the owner of a ultra low disturbance cultivator. I don't know whether that also gets me thrown out of the club. Um, but uh, we use it for sort of traffic headlands. But if your soil is transitioning and it needs help, then make sure that the piece of equipment you get and use is targeting exactly that problem. So, you know, we historically, you know, if we had a bit of compaction, before you know it, there's a great big tractor and a subsoil on the back of it. Didn't matter the fact the compaction was at sort of five or six inches and I was heaving up at about 16. Um, so, you know, we, 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 you know, I'll promo him. It's Chris at Tilso. You know, he has constructed and he is a, you know, he's a soil guy and has engineered, you know, a piece of equipment that we can use to specifically target the problem and if that eases the transition so there's no point just taking the view well you know I'm a no-till farmer you know I'm not going to do anything you know if the soil needs help then to come to the Ed's point earlier you know it's hybrid so you know don't be afraid if it needs something and it's what we use our cover crops for so our cover crops are an indicator so if the green cover crop hasn't grown very well somewhere there's two things it is it's either physical so I've got compaction or it's nutrient so if it's nutrient, I can do something about it. And if it's physical, well, I'm afraid a tractor and a piece of equipment has got to come out and deal with that. I'd, I'd also add that if you've got a group of people who have been no, doing no-till for a number of years, they'd be split as to whether or not you should spray off your cover you know, a month in advance or leave it and drill on the green. And um, I think you know, that's all a part of the fun, isn't it? It's the, the learning of it. But... Um, We've started, we're doing a trial with Rothamsted where we're trying to put different mixes down the spout in the spring. And we, we definitely, us, we're seeing an improvement in emergence with some of those. But I, as Jimmy alluded to earlier, there are quite a lot of snake oil salesmen out there as well. We question here, please. Uh, do, do you mind just waiting for the mic? Thanks. Perhaps um, early on in the uh, diet drilling journey, have any of you run into any trouble with slugs? And if you did, how did you get on top of it, please? Yeah, slugs, slugs are a nightmare sometimes. But also, sometimes they just vanish of their own accord. In, in, in our world, they're like a mythical thing. We can, you know, behind a block of rape, we can direct drill wheat and five out of six fields can't find a slug. Sixth field can't find a piece of wheat. Um, so we have... I have learned to spend a lot more of my life uh, rootling around in the bottom of stubbles. Um, and in our system, what we found is actually instead of instead of waiting, you know, till two days before drilling and putting a sprayer across it, you know, to remove um, you know, rape volunteers and, and black grasses, actually, I don't sound like a broken record at the minute. Sheep, <laughs> put sheep out there, remove oilseed rape volunteers, allow natural predators in. So sheep out in the field of oilseed rape, rooks will always appear because there's muck and they will always disturb some worms. Rooks will also happily then eat slugs because you've removed that lovely canopy of green or see rape volunteers. Rooks will have a go at them. We've tended to manage, and if we do need to apply slug pellets, um, we use ferric phosphate instead of... We have been using ferric phosphate instead of metaldehyde for a long time, and I've never found them to be any less efficient than metaldehyde um, ever was when we used to use it. Chris? Yeah, I mean, we do use a few slug pellets, but not very much. I mean, keep... Don't keep the rate rotation, you know, work, keep the rate well apart. Um, and that's obviously very important. Um, the other thing is that if you, every time you put an insecticide on, you're killing a lot of the predators who, who would be killing the slugs for you. You've got beetles, you've got all sorts of things in there. You've got nematodes that will eat the eggs. Um, I think if you go down the route of regenerative farming and reducing your insecticide use, keeping the rate rotation um, not too tight. Um, we've solved 90% of our problems with slugs, but we do still occasionally have to put 
slug pellets on. I think the other thing we did, one of the reasons we get another reason for giving up mustard in the cover crop mix is that mustard's a brassica. So you're just creating an even, again, a perfect uh, environment for slugs to develop in. Uh, slug hunting, a uh, mythical creature, I think, is actually, I've never heard it like that. I mean, it's, it's, for us, it's completely random. Um, that just, you know, occasionally, as Ed says, a lump of crop will just disappear. And you think, well, that'll disappear on the heavy bit. So, and it, actually, it's randomly disappeared on the light bit. So it is, what I would say, just sort of slightly unrelated, but a bit related, is when the biology, what we've seen on our farm, is when the biology becomes much more active, the residues spend much more, much less time on the surface. So when we're direct drilling into a combinable piece double, for instance, it is amazing how quickly that mat of residue disappears. Brilliant. Um, a qu another question at the front. Um, one thing I'd, I'd like to touch on after your question, Sarah, is just about what what you're finding about a rotation, if there's some things that you've tried that you've now moved away from, perhaps you have a think about that after this gentleman's question. I just wondered, uh, you mentioned compost. I just wondered how you're using your compost. So I'm saving up for a compost turner. I've taken a photograph of the one down the way. I've got a quote for about 65,000 quid for one, which I thought was quite stiff. Um, we, so we're interested in carbon to nitrogen ratios. So when we were so historically we've always used a lot of FYM, and which obviously is great from a nutrient standpoint and biology standpoint. But it, again, it was this question of can we make better use of this? And so we have been blending now. And I use blending; it sounds a lot more methodical than it is. It's a bucket of that, bucket of that, um, compost and turkey muck together in order to um, again make that nutrient more plant available. So I love it. I think it's I think it's fantastic. When, when do you put it up? Well, how do you, how do you use it? When do you when do you how do you apply it? And when so do you put it? we apply it um, before oilseed rape. So um, we apply six tons a hectare of uh, turkey muck, and we apply three tons a hectare of the compost. So two to one. We've actually got trials at the moment because, of course, what we don't know is what the right ratio is. So um, you know, it may be actually I should be pushing twice the uh, load of compost with the FYM. I don't know whether any of the guys here have done any of their own trials work. It's, it's another one of those classic things that, you know, a lot of this research has to be farmer-led. You know, none of the nitrogen-producing companies are chomping at the bit to be doing trials for this sort of stuff. So unless we're doing it ourselves, none of this data is going to be revealed. But um, what we have learned, particularly with the compost, is it's just a great soil conditioner. Um, Ed, you've got... Um uh, so you've got cattle and you've got pigs and your sheep, obviously. Do you do, do anything with a uh, pig and cattle, um, slurries and muck? Uh, so we, we put a lot of bugs in slurry lagoons, uh, looking at trying to uh, reduce ammonia loss from lagoons. Our lagoons are still uncovered. One day I will shake the sofa and enough cash will fall out and I'll be able to put a roof on top of them and stop water falling into them and use it a bit better. Um, FYM, we're maybe quite old-fashioned in FYM terms. We... We'd, we'd, we'd tip it in the corner of a field and push it up and spread it. Um, may I need to, maybe I need, I, need, I need to take tips on compost. I can collar James afterwards. Um, so, Chris, come, any more questions? Please stick your hand up. We've got about another five minutes. But um, in terms of things that you've tried rotation-wise, that since you've gone down this route, Chris, is, is there anything that you, you could have done previously that you can't do now? You know, we all try and do those ro rotations where you do a cropping plan, a five-year cropping plan. I've never, ever kept to a cropping plan in the rotation. I think you, the word flexible rotation is what you need because you need to get out into the field and see what, what you think is best for that particular field. I mean, obviously, you want to try, particularly with the wheat prices today, get as much wheat in as you possibly can. So, um, you know, there is a great temptation to put, put a wheat crop in after a break crop. But, um, uh, you know, what you put in after that, it depends on the, on the, on the weeds in the fields. There's a lot of things. Uh, I, I, would, I would just say keep it, keep it flexible. Jimmy, what about you? Any changes that you've made? Yeah, I mean, fle flexibility is absolutely key. I mean, you know, listening to Ed, you know, I'm only growing about five crops, 17. It really looks like I'm not trying. 
Um, we base our cropping on that particular year, on those particular soil conditions, with that particular soil test result. So there's a lot of thought process. Ed made the absolutely valid point. He's sort of, you know, oh, I've got an eight-year rotation. For me, it doesn't work. It's a nonsense. You know, that has to be your gauging what particular crop on what particular year. The only thing we have is we grow forage rye, and the rate will always for follow forage rye. It allows me to then, the crop comes off in June, allows me to get a burst seam clover in, which then the rape is then direct drilled into. But that is the only hard and fast thing. If the soil isn't right, and I can get a plant, a bit of botany, a green cover crop, to do the job for me to improve it, and then spring crock it, crop it, that is what we do. Yeah, um, I'd be interested in what you do, Ed. What we have found that um, we used to use winter oats as a, as a break, and, and actually in no-till, they, they take a lot of nutrient out the ground, and we've had issues with trying to grow winter wheat after, after uh, winter oats, so we would now follow that with a, with a spring break. Uh, and, and Chris, you say about spring barley, I know there are a lot of no-tillers that steer well clear of that because of troubles. Can I just say one more thing? Is we, so we used to rent land for potatoes. We've got a big irrigation license. We also grew a lot of sugar beet. Coming out of sugar beet is the one farming decision I've ever made that I've never questioned. Um, to, saying no to the potato rent was a much, much more difficult one. But we found that the sheer damage the potatoes were doing within our system meant that it didn't really fit with what we were doing. Sorry. No, thanks, Jimmy. And Ed, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, as Jimmy uh, uh, has alluded to, yeah, uh, flexibility is, is 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 key. I mean, with yeah, seventeen different combinable crops, I have flexibility. I my cropping plan, if I'm really honest, solidifies when a drill enters a field and I actually watch it put something in the ground. Up until that moment, anything can change depending on soil type, access to markets. Um, you know, I had a conversation with Bertie, who I think he's run, had to run off now. Uh, our local miller, who we supplied our stuff to. We have a vague idea about what tonnages he wants. We have a vague idea about how much ground I need to have for him to produce that. And that is, that's about as firm as a cropping plan is because as long as I can produce what he wants, it can go wherever it needs to. Um, also, uh, when things go really wrong in the rotation, um, I then call it a fodder crop. Sheep, again, in my saving grace. When it's a disaster, you put an electric fence around it and go, we're always going to graze it anyway. We're never going to combine that. That was never going near a grain store. That's why it was always going into a sheep because it was, uh, it was an experiment. And um, it was going to be a spring crop anyway, so that's fine. So, um, yeah, learn, learning, learning to roll with the punches is sometimes a really important thing with it as well. Brilliant. Well, uh, we're out of time, but if I firstly may say thank you very much for all your questions. Thanks for, for coming and listening to us. But also if we can thank Jimmy, Chris and Ed for sharing with us their thoughts. <laughs>